Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour. Uh, je suis Christopher Manfredi, doyen de la Faculté des Arts, l'Université McGill, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome everyone here this afternoon uh, to the fourth Kundal Prize lecture in one of those uh, great hidden gem locations at McGill University uh, that uh, reflects uh, not only the uh, historical origins of the university in many ways, but also its uh, pluralism and uh, and, uh, and uh, ability to welcome uh, a diversity of, of individuals from across the campus and across, across the world. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome you to the fourth Kundal Prize lecture, a prize that awards three significant monetary, uh, monetary uh, awards, two recognition of excellence awards, each with a value of $10,000, and one grand prize of $75,000, and the winner of the 2012 Kundal Prize will be announced later this evening. The Kundal Prize was established uh, to recognize authors who have published books determined to have a profound literary, social, and academic impact on their selected subject. It was founded through the generosity of McGill alumnus Peter Kundal. A particular emphasis of the prize is placed on well-written books that contribute to knowledge and that can be read and understood by experts, but that are also appealing to informed readers alike. And since I know everyone in this room is an informed reader, you will no doubt notice that the books are for sale at the entrance in the, uh, in the foyer, so please avail yourself of that opportunity. I'd now like to introduce uh, Professor John Zuki from the Department of History and Classical Studies, who will introduce our uh, speaker this evening. John. It's my great pleasure to introduce the 2012 Kundal Lecture, Sergio Luzzato. He hasn't made my life easy because his publications list is very long and I, may, I don't want to be longer than our speaker this evening, so I've synthesized. Professor Luzzato studied history in Pisa, Paris, and New York. He's taught at the universities of Genoa, Macerata, and currently Turin, where he's a professor of modern history. And he splits his time between Turin and Geneva, where his family lives. Professor Luzzato is an eclectic historian and has worked on 18th and 19th century French history and more recently on 20th century Italian history. I can't go through all of his many publications, but here is a brief selection. The one that we all know, the winner of the Kundal Prize 2011, Pau de Pio, Miracles in Politics in a Secular Age. The jury called this work masterful, its research staggeringly deep and wide, and indeed it is, and to repeat Dean Manfredi's comments, if you haven't read, read the book, do so and do purchase a copy at the back. Other books are Bonbon Robespierre, La Terreur de a Visage Humain, The Body of Il Duce, Mussolini's Corpse and the Fortunes of Italy. The Italian edition of this book was shortlisted for the uh, Via Reggio Prize in 1999. La Crisi de l'Antifascismo, The Crisis of Antifascism, L'Automne de la Révolution, L'Automne de la Révolution, Lutte et Culture Politique dans la France Thermidorienne. Sergio Luzzato's books have appeared not only in English, French, and Italian, but also in German and Japanese. Professor Luzzato is clearly not a closet intellectual. His topics, Padre Pio, Mussolini's body, anti-fascism, are bound to and do stir up a great deal of controversy in the press and blogs in Italy and around the world. He has been a regular contributor to two of Italy's leading dailies, La Stampa and Correa della Sera, and most recently to the Sunday supplement of Il Sole 24 Ore, the Italian equivalent of the Financial Times. This evening, Professor Luzzato is going to be speaking to us about Primo Levi. We all know Levi, the, the, the chemist, the, uh, the writer, the poet, this brave Italian Jew who survived Auschwitz. This evening, Professor Luzzato will speak about Primo Levi, the partisan, Last year at the Kundal ceremony in London, I had the pleasure of sitting with Sergio Luzzato and Claire Messina. I asked him some questions about his department. He said that in many ways he was a bit of an outsider to his department in Turin because, among other reasons, he had spent and spent so much time outside of Italy, in France, the US, and Switzerland, so that he could not really answer my questions. Sergio, I want you to know that as a winner of the 2011 Kundal Prize, as an internationally recognized historian, you are no interloper or outsider of McGill University, but very much at home, and I'm sure our audience's warm welcome will make that evident to you.
Thank you, John, for the, the words you just had. And uh, thank you, Chris. And I would like to thank everybody, of course, who is uh, here tonight. Uh, uh, most of all, the people, the organizer of the Candle Prize. Uh, I met some of them in London last year, and I just met some of them here in Montreal. And I'm extremely pleased to have this occasion tonight to uh, try to share something with you. Uh, I would like also to say that um, just a few words about what meant for me to, uh, to win this prize, which is uh, also the opportunity I have, of course, today to introduce you to my, to my lecture. But to win this prize was just wonderful for me, and not only for the big amount of Canadian dollars you were, <laughs> you were told about, uh, but for what uh, it meant in terms of uh, uh, how, how should I say, international recognition. Uh, my, my book on Padre Pio was not reviewed by one of the most influential reviews in, uh, worldwide, and that is the New York Review of Books, until I won the Candle Prize, which was somehow maybe you know, related to the fact that it didn't have much impact until I, I won this prize. And generally speaking, I... During the last year, I was often uh, asked about this prize uh, since uh, I live in between several countries, uh, France, Switzerland, Italy. I, I hope I have been somehow an ambassador of this prize during the last 12 months, and this is a real honor for me. So uh, last year, uh, I was uh, in London, and uh, I was honored with, this, I, was, I was awarded this prize for book on Padre Pio. Today I have a much different topic. Uh, as you all see, uh, today I'm not going to, uh, to be dealing with uh, a very important, important figure for you know, Catholicism and somehow for Christianity worldwide, but with, with, you know, with a completely different character. Although somehow I do feel that to me, I mean, let me put it this way, Primo Levi is as much a saint, so to speak, as Padre Pio is for others. So uh, uh, what I'm going to, to do tonight is to you know, try to introduce you, you to my forthcoming book, which is about Primo Levi and about uh, 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 Italian resistance. Uh, but, uh, and some of, some of the things maybe I'm going to tell you tonight uh, are, going to buy in, are going to sound to your ears somehow controversial. Uh, but by no means I would like to, you to, to think that, uh, er, er, that I have er, uh, taken too much distance from my character. Of course, historians have to distance themselves from the characters, but I can hardly think of a single character in 20th century Italy which I feel more strongly about than Primo Levi. Uh, Primo Levi, the partisan. Maybe the very title of my lecture is going to sound a little bit weird in the sense that we are used to think of Primo Levi uh, less than as a, as a, as a fighter uh, than a, as a victim. And of course, as a witness of the, of, of, of the holo of, of Holocaust, of the final solution of uh, 20th century evil. But to think of him as a as a witness means that we have to you know, start the story somehow too late, when, when Primo Levi was, has already been deported, when he had already been in Auschwitz and so on. Uh, what I try to do with my actual project, which is about to, come, uh, to become a book in Italy and uh, hopefully uh, abroad, uh, is something different. So uh, instead of uh, starting to look at Primo Levi after or during or after the deportation in Auschwitz, which was, you know, going to become the main, of course, uh, experience of his life and was going to become so meaningful uh, because of the soundness, the insightfulness of his reflection about uh, the Holocaust as it uh, made it uh, in If This a Man and in uh, other, the other books he wrote uh, during uh, his life. No, uh, my decision was to be a little bit more uh, uh, daring, maybe, and to look at him before Auschwitz, which is something some biographers had done, but uh, somehow was a neglected topic for historians. So what does it mean, Primo Levi, uh, 
the partisan. It, mean to, it means to look at another, Primo, uh, Primo Levi. And when I say this, I have to, uh, uh, to say that um, somehow, there is, in my opinion, there, to, to look at Primo Levi as a, as a resistant, as a rebel, is helpful because these are not two segregated parts and sides of his life. Uh, he, he was deported to Auschwitz ultimately as a Jew, but originally as a partisan, as a fighter. And this is important enough to remember, but also I was, uh, as I will be trying to show you, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's complicated and problematic uh, enough. So uh, there are at least two themes I will be trying to touch on tonight, which uh, may sound to you as, as themes we, that are very uh, uh, central in Primo Levi's experience, and that usually we uh, think they belong to uh, his uh, uh, Auschwitz experience. And that is the theme of uh, shame. Uh, th th not necessarily the, sh the shame for perpetrators, the, the, the shame for the evil w which was perpetrated in Auschwitz, but the shame of the victim, which is, of course, one of the main uh, points uh, particularly in, the, in Primo Levi's reflection of the later stages of, of his life. And this theme, for instance, the shame of, uh, of, uh, of evil, is something we are going to find already in his uh, resistance period. And the second theme, which is at stake, when you look at Primo Levi, before Primo Levi, so to speak, and that is before he has been uh, deported, is the, the theme which he defined as the gray zone problem, la zona grigia. That is the reflection she ma he made about the difficulty and almost the impossibility of s separating in a sharp way the good from the bad sides of the story and particularly the problem of the different degrees in personal responsibilities as far as violence is concerned. And again, this is something he wrote about, mainly about Auschwitz, about the lager, but we are going to find it, surprisingly enough, in uh, this earlier stage of his uh, life. And the third theme I was, I was I, I'm going to be somehow uh, pointing to is the theme, of course, of uh, testimony. What does it mean to be a witness? Uh, I, I'm going to try to argue and to convince you that P Primo Levi tried to be a witness and he was brave enough to do it, not only as a Holocaust survivor, but also as a very problematic rebel, resistant, partisan fighter. So this is going to be uh, somehow the, 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 the theme of, uh, of my conversation tonight. And first of all, I have to set the context, of course. When did um, Primo Levi become a partisan? And so the, the context is the one of Italy after September 8th, 1943. The armistice, uh, Anglo-American troops have landed to Sicily and started to liberate Italy from the, from the south. And this is when German occupation starts in Italy. And uh, basically, southern, the southern part of Italy, one third of the country, is already liberated by their uh, Anglo-Americans, Canadians, Australians, or whatever. And uh, two thirds of the country are still under still, they, they start to be under the German rule. And this is what we called, of course, we called occupied Italy. And uh, at that moment, most Italians have basically the most, Itali mo most young male Italians have to decide what to do. And they are confronted with basically three options. Uh, I mean, people in the age of serving in the army, they, to, to, of, of fighting, they, have, they can decide to uh, uh, you know, serve with the, the puppet republic of Salon, that is the, the republic that Germans established in Italy uh, as an as a, uh, ally uh, to their, to their to, uh, for occupation, uh, and this is the first option. And basically not much, very, very few Italians decide to do so. And the second option is to evade the draft and just to hide. And this is what most people do. And the third option is to rebel, is to decide to join 
the first partisan units. And so this is, so to speak, the main picture. But then there is a, the kind of, a kind of detail in the picture, and that is the very peculiar condition of Italian Jews, which is, of course, the community to, to which Primo Levi belongs. Because Italian Jews don't have this, uh, these three options, basically, because they are not asked, of, for, of course, to uh, sign up for the Germans as uh, uh, German soldiers, so to speak. Uh, and so the two options left are the one of, in theory, are the one of hide, hiding, or fighting. But to hide under the German rule is very, very dangerous because it can be, you know, it can prove to be ineffective and it can mean uh, uh, capture and deportation. So s plenty of young Italian Jews decide much more in percentage as you know, the importance of Italian Jewry within the demography of the country, plenty of Italian Jews decide to fight. And this is something that Primo Levi somehow decides as well. And Primo goes to the mountains. That is, uh, he's from Turin, he, lives, he, he, he grew up close to the mountains, he likes you know, climbing, he likes skiing, and, uh, and so the man, mountains are there and they seem to be available. And he's 24 years old. He's in a good physical shape. The only problem is that since racial laws in 1938 had excluded Italian Jews from the military service, he's not trained at all. And he belongs to a generation which is really very much unable to uh, handle any weapon. And so it is particularly difficult for him and for young Italian Jews uh, belonging to his generation to make this choice, but at the same time, it's almost, almost inevitable. And so this is how Primo goes to the mountains, and where does, it go, does he go? He goes to the Aosta Valley, Valle d'Aosta. Uh, this is a picture you have of, northern, of the northwest tip of Italy, and Piedmont is basically where you can see the green, and uh, uh, the Valle d'Aosta is where you can see the white... Uh, 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 the, the Mont Blanc or the Monte Rosa or whatever, the, the Alpine uh, uh, peaks. And then here is where he goes. And so we have to think of this. We, we, what I'm going to try to do tonight is not to you know, let you think of Primo Levi already in Auschwitz. This, is the, this was a long journey to make, so to speak. Uh, we want to concentrate on him before getting there. And uh, we are going to see that he had many problems even before getting there, although they were somehow not as, as terrible as the ones he was going to be confronted to later on, uh, just in the few months following uh, autumn, uh, fall 1943. So he goes to the, to the mountains, and he goes to the Aosta Valley, and uh, he uh, settles in a very tiny r resort, uh, on uphill of Saint Vincent, uh, the, the name of the of the village is Amai, Amai, and uh, I mean you you will not know it. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's a really a 200 person you know inhabitant village there, and nobody knows about Amai even today in Italy, and we discovered with Claire Amai just a few years ago, uh, a beautiful place but a very difficult place to be when German, Italy is occupied and uh, you are a young Jew and you want to fight the resistance and you don't know how to do it. So this is the choice he makes, but he makes in a, somehow a, a, a double vein. And that is, on, on the one side, he does feel that he's an anti-fascist and he, he wants to not just to resign himself about you know, the final solution or the danger of deportation, he wants to do something against the enemy. But the, the second vein of this is possibly fear, or in any case, very much the conscience of not being uh, ready for it and not being equipped, uh, both in terms of military uh, training and possibly even in terms of psychological uh, uh, endurance, so to speak. And so uh, a proof of this, an evidence of this, is that he gets there in Amai with his mother and his sister which is, you know, a, a strange way of being a partisan. Uh, but uh, then uh, he knows it perfectly, 
and, uh, but he feels also this responsibility about his own family. Uh, their father, I mean, his father had died, had passed away the year before in 1942. He's uh, the man of a persecuted family of three. And so he gets to Amai, uh, the, the village you can see from this picture, um, with his mother and his uh, young sister. So this is what I want you to think about. Uh, a young man completely unprepared to fight the resistance, but willing to do it, and somehow not ready to do it. And this is where he joins a band of partisans. Uh, we shouldn't think of the early stages of the resistance in Italy and even elsewhere in Europe as, you know, mythology wants us to think of. And that these people, you know, Motiv clearly motivated about the choice, people, uh, you know, really uh, already, already somehow liberators uh, who were, you know, it will take a while, but uh, we, we, we are going to win us because we are the best ones and we fight for good values instead of fighting for the bad ones. Yes, of course, this is in theory what we would like to think, but uh, early stages of the resistance in Italy and elsewhere which were much more complicated and less easily, easily readable, so to speak, in ethical terms. It was much more um, gray, to pick, gray to pick up Primo Levi's words. It's not black and white. It's, it's gray. And so people there are basically, at the beginning, are draft evaders, are people who don't want to fight for the Germans and are not necessarily willing to fight for Americans or for for Italy. Uh, this doesn't mean, doesn't mean uh, much to them. And uh, the condition, the situation of Itali Italian Jews is different because they fight for life instead of just trying to survive occupation. And uh, this uh, is the case for Primo Levi, for his family, until uh, uh, a single day, which is very important in this story, and which is November the 30th, the last day of November when police order number five is issued by the Salò Republic, the puppet Republic of Italy. And the, or police, for, or police order number five um, orders the capture, the arrest, and the deportation of all Jews, Italian and foreign Jews, living in occupied Italy. And this is basically the very beginning of the final solution in Italy. Although there have been uh, pogroms, so to speak, and, and uh, rafle, uh, even before in Rome, in the Rome ghetto, but it is on December 1st that Italian Jews and foreign Jews living in Italy understand that for them it's going to be over. They don't have any right anymore to, to survive in occupied Italy. And so what happens is that very day, December the 1st of 1943, Primo Levi's mother and sister leave the village of Amai. Because Primo Levi's sisters decide that it's not uh, good anymore to stay in the mountains, where they had hoped to be able to escape to Switzerland. I think this was the reason why we, they, they got to the Aosta Valley. Because the Swiss border was very closed, and they could hope, as other Italian Jews, to be able to cross this border with the help of passeurs and to get to Switzerland, which meant salvation. But in fact, of course, this was the winter or, you know, late in the fall, the passes, Alpine passes, uh, uh, impossible, basically, to go behind that, 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 that border, uh, which was guarded, by the way. And so uh, Primo's sister and mother just leave Amai, and Primo stays there. And starting from December the 1st, somehow, he's not anymore a refugee, a Jew, Jew refugee in his own country. Uh, starting from December the 1st, he has to make a decision, a straight one. He has to decide whether he's going to be a partisan or not. And uh, days, I mean, the, the schedule is important. The chronology is very important in this story because it's a matter of days. 13 days after, he's going to be captured. On December 13, He's going to be arrested by Italian militias collaborating with the Germans. He's going to spend one month in Aosta as a, as a 
detainee, detainee in, a, in, in a Aosta prison, and then he's going to be in Fossoli, which is the concentration camp near Modena, and then he's going to leave to Auschwitz. Uh, but this is the story of the two following months. The story we are looking at now, to now is these few days that separate December the 1st to December 13th. Uh, when my, Primo, Slavis, Primo Levi's mother and sister leave, two young women join um, Primo at Amai, and they are two of the, his best friends. Uh, they are two uh, uh, actually doctors who were his fellows in Turin uh, at their faculty of science and medicine and so on. And one of them, there are two female friends. Uh, one was named, uh, was called uh, Luciana Nissin, and the other one was called Vanda Maestro. So this is, uh, by the way, we can, uh, somehow this is not a good quality picture, but these, uh, these are the three persons we are talking about. Primo at the center, and his two young female friends uh, on the right and on, the, on your left. And so they are there, and they live where? In Amai, I told you, where? In a hotel, uh, in a pension, in a, uh, uh, in a locanda, in a, a very modest one. We are uphill, 1,600 meters on the level of the sea. We are in the mountains. But this is another side of the problem, so to speak. Primo Levi, the partisan, is living in a hotel. And uh, uh, he's trying to do something as a partisan. And basically, he tries with other fellow Jews, what? To uh, draft young rebels, to find some young people you know, ready to fight, and to arm them with uh, you know, weapons. And so what they do is to try, to, every now and then, but very few, in very few occasions, they leave Amai uphill and they go, they go down to the Aosta Valley to try to find arms in, uh, in their garnisons or whatever. And this, there are possibly two occasions when he does so. Once with a friend of him who is called Aldo Piacenza, and another time he does it with the Vanda, his female friend. This is all what he does, so to speak, except another thing I'm going to tell you about very soon. Uh, I met Aldo Piacenza. I met the very person who was living with Primo Levi in this resort, in this locanda, and who was captured with him on December 13th. He's there. He's an old man. 92, 93 years old man living in Turin, where he has been a lawyer for decades. And he's still there. And I was able last year to you know, ask him questions about. I met even the young guy who was uh, somehow the waiter uh, in the hotel at that time and who wakened up Primo Levi the day he was captured. He saw the militias coming up from the Aosta Valley and he, he told me, I woke him up, and the two girls, and I said, they are coming. So this is a, a lively story. This is living history, so to speak. But as I will try to show, uh, it's also uh, the most dramatic one. Because before, before being captured, uh, something happens during those you know, very traumatic days uh, I'm talking about. And this is something that Primo Levi is going to uh, call an ugly secret. An ugly secret, and I will be more specific about that. Uh, this is something he wrote about in the book you can see here, which is the periodic table, which is basically his autobiography. And this is the book he wrote in, and he published in Italian in 1975, and that is 30 years after the war and the deportation. And this is a wonderful book where he uh, uh, tells the story of his life uh, in somehow a chemical frame uh, as a chemist. And, uh, uh, and in that book, he writes something which is very important, but which has never been 
really studied, which, which went almost un, uh, un whatever. <laughs> Sorry? Unnoticed, thank you. Uh, at the time when the book was published. And uh, in my opinion, is by no means something which you know, deserves to, be, to go unnoticed. And this is the ugly secret. So uh, I don't know whether the, 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 photo, the picture I, got, I took of the page is uh, clear enough to allow you reading. And so I will read about the ugly secret with you. Uh, we are reading the page where Primo Levi has, he's, 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 he's talking about his resistant period. And he says, he says the truth. He tells the truth. He says, I spent there three months and I was, it was almost pathetic. It was ineffective. We, I, we were unable to, you know, to do anything uh, important and effective against the, the Germans. But the main problem we had was that among us, in each of our minds, weighed an ugly secret. The same secret that had exposed us to capture, extinguishing in us a few days before all will to resist, indeed to live. We had been forced by our consciences to carry out a sentence and had carried it out. We had come out of it destroyed, destitute, waiting for everything to finish and to be finished ourselves but also wanting to see each other, to talk, to help each other exercise that so recent memory. Now we were finished and we knew, we knew it. We were in the trap, each one on his own trap, and there was no way out except down. What a secret. And it, it, it is somehow, for, for me, it's even, I would say, it's interesting in terms of, of, of how history is, is, is written or is made or whatever, that nobody picked it up. You, you wouldn't find in the immense Primo Levi's bibliography not even an article about this ugly secret. Not even, I would say, a page about this ugly secret. And this is what I decided to do, to you know, find more about that. Uh, in the book which I just finished to, to write, and it, it is not necessarily about this, but it, it is about the band, the, the partisan unit Primo Levi was belonging to. And so it, this is a book which is not necessarily about Primo Levi, but about uh, one story, one possible story of the Italian resistance through the example of this band. But let's us come back to the ugly secret. What did it happen? to authorize Primo Levi 30 years later to write such a page. What happened is that this part, you, you see, uh, I, I told you this is a story going about, you know, days. Few days before he writes. And uh, uh, this is going on between December the 1st and December the 9th. That is, you know, the week before Primo Levi Luciana Nissim and Vanda Maestro were arrested by Italian militias and deported to Auschwitz. What happens is that some young partisans coming from the Monferrato, that is a, you know, a sector of the Pianura Padana, of the plain, in Piedmontese plain, not far away from Turin. A couple, even more than that, four or five young rebels draft evaders from the Monferrato have joined this partisan unit in Amai. And they are young, they are rebels, they are very voluntary, very motivated to do what? First of all, to evade the draft, not to fight for the Germans, not to go, you know, to be taken in Germany, to be trained as military in the, in the, in the, in the, for the Wehrmacht, basically. And uh, they are young. Uh, they are, this is Fulvio Opezzo. This is one of, of two of them, which are the most important characters, so to speak, in the story I'm telling you. Nobody would know about Fulvio Opezzo in Italy. And I knew nothing about him until 
a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, when I, start, you know, I started my research. Fulvio Pezzo is nobody. Uh, you can Google him, and you basically are not going to find him on Google, except for the square which was named after him in his village in Monferrato. The main square of Cerina Monferrato, which is a village, a 1,000 1, people village in Monferrato. The main square of the village is named after Fulvio Pezzo. And the primary school in the village is named after Fulvio Pezzo. And this is the only reason you will find Fulvio Pezzo on Google. Uh, as I'm going to, I mean, to tell you, this is uh, problematic enough. Because you, you would think of him as a hero of the resistance. Why, why should the, the, square, the main square in Cerina be named after Fulvio Pezzo if he were, he were not a partisan hero? He was not a partisan hero. He was a young rebel who started to fight the resistance. And what does it mean? Did, did it mean to fight the resistance in the early stages of the of German uh, occupation of Italy? It meant to uh, you know, try to yeah, collect arms and to what? To find food and to find uh, uh, wood to uh, be able to survive the temperatures of Amai uh, in December. And so as far as I was able to recon you know, re re find this story uh, in the archives, uh, this is what Lu Fulvio did together with Luciano, Luciano Zabaldano. Fulvio was 18 years old. You can see from this picture. He was very, very young. And by the way, he has a uniform here because he was trained in the military uh, before the armistice. And uh, Luciano as well was uh, from the military. He was serving in the Navy. But, I mean, in this sense, they were very representative of young Italians who after the armistice were unwilling to fight with the Germans and who, you know, went in the mountains, first of all, to evade the draft of, of the fascist republic and second, uh, second possibly, to fight the resistance. Uh, it seems that they fought it with too much energy. Uh, it was very difficult, of course, to find a, a balance in those very early stages and to decide what you wanted to do and what you didn't want to do as an early partisan. Because, I, I mean, I, I think they could hardly go, you know, to the people living in, the, in a village as Amai, 200 people, and just to, you know, take them away, uh, butter or flour, or uh, the very few items that which, which were worth to people in the mountains in occupied Italy. But this is also somehow, I guess, what, what they had to do to be able to survive in the mountains. Uh, on uh, early in the morning of November the 9th, uh, Primo Levi and his fellows of the partisan unit in Amai decided to kill Luciano and Fulvio. And this is what Primo Levi meant when he wrote 30 years later that they had to execute a death sentence. And uh, uh, although I was unable to uh, figure out exactly what happened, uh, there was no such thing as a, as a trial, in, not even a summary one, of course. It would have been impossible to organize such a thing uh, in, uh, in the mountains of Amai. Uh, they used what people started to call at that time the Soviet method and the, during, in, in the resistance. And that is not to tell what was going to happen and with, to find an excuse to have Fulvio and Luciano just, you know, going in the snow and then to, uh, you know, kill them with a machine gun there in the snow with no words, with no explanation. This is an ugly secret enough except that it's not a secret. It had been a secret for 30 years, and Primo Levi was brave enough, in my opinion, to, you know, go in public about this in his memoir. But Italy was not ready at that time to deal with such a thing. 
uh, I mean, we don't have time here to go on it Italy in the 70s and the neo-fascist, uh, you know, strategies uh, in Italy during the 70s or whatever. I mean, at that time, it was very important to think as to the resistance as a, as a myth. And uh, nobody was willing to, uh, to be historians enough and to look closer at things and to understand that to find such, to work on such a secret by no means uh, means that we are going to say nasty things about the resistance or we are, or we are willing to be revisionist about the resistance. It's just that history is rich, complex, complicated. And as I was mentioning, the gray zone and the, the, the problems of the different degrees in responsibility and in, you know, the perpetration of violence, even partisans had to be violent. And in some, in some occasions, in some situations, they, they had to be violent even against themselves. Primo Levi, I think, um, had a very hard time in adjusting to such a secret. He was captured on the November the, uh, December 13th together with Wanda and Luciana. Uh, Wanda never came back from Auschwitz. She was, you know, gassed in Birkenau. Uh, Luciana and Primo were lucky enough to survive, to come back. And of course, this meant uh, several things for Primo Levi. And, you know, I'm, I'm not even trying to convince you how much this was a weight for him, the very fact of having survived for the rest of his life. Of course, this was a primary trauma, so to speak, of Primo Levi. But there was a secondary one, which I'm pointing to uh, tonight with you. And this is the trauma of the ugly secret. And again, evidence is there, has always been there. But, I mean, people were not picking it up. And the, the poem I, I'm showing tonight to you is a, a poem Primo Levi wrote in 1932. And that is uh, nine years later. And we don't have enough space and time allowed tonight to read it together. But basically, this is a, a poem that he wrote on the model of the Spoon River Anthology. And the person who is speaking in this poem, who is addressing uh, an imaginary audience in this, poem, in this poem, is Fulvio or Luciano, one of the two. That is, this person says, here, I was buried here in the mountains. I was killed by my own uh, dry-eyed comrades for a no small crime. And Fulvio or Luciano here, through Primo's, Primo Levi's words, are begging the, the people who pass, in, pass by to, uh, to allow peace to endure. What I'm, what I'm saying is that this secret never abandoned Primo Levi. And uh, uh, in my opinion, when Primo Levi, almost 40 years later, published his book, which is, is called in Italian and then translated into English as If Not Now, Then, which is uh, his only novel, and which supposedly uh, is a book about the Ashkenazi uh, resistance by uh, Jewish uh, partisan units in, uh, in, uh, on the Eastern Front in Belarus, in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, in Russia, uh, during uh, the, the, the World War II, uh, in my opinion, uh, basically what Primo Levi was doing was to, uh, 40 years later, to writing about his own somehow failed resistance. And in any case, about the problem of the gray zone and the problem of evil not being uh, such a thing that you can put it on one side and to have you know, goodness completely on the other side. And the last text I'm going to uh, be pointing to tonight is this poem which was written in the same period, 1981, which was published again because evidence was there, but nobody cared. And uh, this is a book where, uh, sorry, is a poem where he asks because of uh, 
revisionists, precisely because of the atmosphere of the 80s, Primo Levi is, is worried because Holocaust deniers are coming out, uh, negationism is, is, is developing, that is Holocaust denial, and uh, the idea of the resistance as being uh, uh, useless or whatever was you know, building up. He is very worried. He, in this poem, which was published at the time, he asks his own comrades of that time to, you know, to fight again. And this is what he says. We have to go back to the mountains. We want to go there. It's going to be hard because we are you know, aged now. But this is what, what, what we want to do because the danger is still there. And uh, we don't want our enemy to come back. And this is what you will find in you know, the first two-thirds of this poem. But the lines uh, I'm going to read with you tonight are the last ones in this poem. Because, uh, yeah, he says, like then we will stand, stand guard so the enemy will not take us by surprise at dawn. What enemy? Every man is the enemy of every other. With everyone split by an inner border. The right hand, enemy of the left. On your feet, old man, enemies of yourselves. Our war is never over. And I think, again, I mean, this is uh, an extra evidence, so to speak, of what I'm have, I've been talking about. And that is uh, this very traumatic experience he had as, as a partisan. Uh, my f last words, I would like to, you know, tell you as a final note, as a footnote, uh, just an anecdote. Uh, possibly the main publishing house in Italy is Einaudi. And I guess all of you heard about it, about it. And it was the publishing house of Primo Levi throughout his life. And... Uh, all you know, Primo Levi's books have been published by Einaudi. And Einaudi, by the way, it's the, I mean, runs, so to speak, the, the, the literary rights of Primo Levi worldwide. And with my book of, on Padre Pio and with most of the books uh, John Zucchi was kind enough to mention tonight were published by Einaudi as well, which you know, I felt as a privilege because it's supposed to be uh, one of the most influential publishing houses in my country. Uh, I, I showed the manuscript of my book to Einaudi quite recently, and they rejected my manuscript. Uh, and they did so because although the ugly secret was, is just you know, one of the themes of my book, I think they felt that this was a story they didn't want to tell. And uh, they were quite, quite uh, explicit about that. They were saying, we are the publisher of Primo Levi worldwide, and we don't want to blacken, so to speak, Primo Levi's reputation which, with your story. Uh, I, I would try to argue tonight that I don't think to tell such a story is a way of blackening Primo Levi. And uh, just the other way around, I find somehow marvelous, but not surprising, according to their Primo Levi's dignity, to Primo Levi's uh, insightfulness, to Primo Levi's morality, that he was the only person in that band to uh, uh, come out, so to speak, with his story almost 40 years ago. And somehow I do regret that Italy nowadays, at least through its main publishing house, its most influential line, line, one, is not ready yet to listen to the story I told you tonight. Thank you. seems almost trivial to speak after such a powerful address. Uh, 
but nonetheless, uh, Sergio Luzzato has accepted uh, to have a question period this evening. So we just ask one thing, that the questions be just that, questions. I'll be up here and I'll be watching for any hands going up. Thanks. Thank you very much for the superb talk. Uh, what you had to say about uh, a quest to find out the meaning of this reminded me a bit of uh, Bernardo Bertolucci's film, uh, La Strategia del Ragno, which was made around 1970, 1971, right. and in which he also, uh, the character in the movie is going to a town to find out the circumstances of his father's death, whose statue stands on the square as a hero of <coughs> resistance. And then he discovers all sorts of complexities and difficulties, and he finds himself in that gray zone. And it's interesting that this come out around the same time as uh, Levy is, is writing about, about his dirty secret. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I guess I do, yes. Uh, thank you for asking this, because it allows me to, you know, to add uh, a little you know, piece to the story. Uh, because I was telling you that uh, uh, in, in Cerina Monferrato, as you just said, I mean, uh, of course, there was, there was some recognition after the war about, about partisan heroes. And every, not only in, the big city, in big cities, but any village would have, which would have you know, a partisan uh, uh, killed by Germans or by Italian fascists, of course, was very willing to uh, honor the memory of this partisan through uh, the name of a street or the name of a square or a school. So, the problem is that, for instance, is the case of Fulvio. What happened? Why, why, why would they name you know, a square after the, after the name of a, a young kid, almost a kid, 18 years old, who was killed by partisan as a potential what? A potential uh, thug, a potential spy, a potential... Uh, I mean, there was, there, unfortunately, there was no explanation. They killed him. What happened after the war, we can easily understand. This unit I was telling you about, I mean, Privo Levi was the captured and deported. By, but most of these, what, seven, eight people who, were in, who belonged to this unit, they were able to escape capture that very day. And most of them kept fighting. And also, thank you to the experience they, was, they were building on the early stages of the, of the resistance, they were able to become accomplished partisans, and they were real ones. And some of the people I was telling you about from this you know, almost negligible partisan unit were some of the liberators of Turin 15 or 16 months after that, and of Casale Monferrato, which is the main city in that, in that province. So what happened is that these partisans after the war, when they were asked about the casualties they had, they were including Fulvio and Luciano as, parties, as you know, fellows killed by the Germans. And this is, you know, we can't understand easily. Why would you expect them after the war to say, wait a moment, I mean, two of them we killed. <laughs> but then, I mean, because things were going that way, they were never clarified, and they, they became the matter of ambiguity. Because then these kind of stories, not this one, the one I told you, but other, just, you know, are, you know, are coming out at the local level, at the, at the provincial, at the village scale. And this is a problem. If you don't tell the truth, then truth is going to be used against you for revisionist purposes, for the bad ones. And just the last word I will say about that is not about Fulvio, but about Luciano. Uh, the picture I, I took, this picture of Luciano, was taken in the, one of the cemeteries of Turin. And Luciano was 17 years old. And one of the most striking experiences I had while researching for this book was, was when I met, through Google, with Luciano's nephew. Because what did, I, I mean, of course, I was going like we, we all do. I was Googling, Googling names 
and trying to figure out who was belonging to what family, to which family, and so on. And so I found out that in a cafe in Turin, possibly, I could meet descendants of Luciano. I mean, Luciano was too young to have kids, but actually, the person I met in this ca cafe in Turin is the son of Luciano's brother. And what I would like to tell you today, tonight, is that, of course, I couldn't go there saying, you know, your uncle, the one you thought it was a partisan, he was not. He was a thug and he was killed by, you know, regular partisans because I couldn't do that. I mean, this history is complicated even in the sense that it's, 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 it's demanding in, in psychological terms, in, in, in ethic ones. And so I went there knowing the, 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 the true story, but not being necessarily willing to tell him about I was just want, I wanted to know what he knew, what in, in his family was known about what happened. And I was, you know, having more or less the assumption that they would believe in their nice and mythological story of Luciano being killed by the Germans. Actually, what, is, what was really impressive for me is that Davide, this person who is my age and who is running the cafe in a popular neighborhood in Turin, he was not naive. And he, he emailed me before meeting. He said, you know, I mean, I will be very glad to meet a professor and because maybe I will know more about this story which is very, has always been somehow disturbing for me. So I said, okay. And then we met in his cafe. And you know what he had in his hands in, when, when I first met him? The page of the periodic t table. Yeah. It was underlined, as I did today for you in that picture. It was just like that. He had that page marked. And he, I, 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 I told this in my book. He was reading the lines I just read you. And he was saying, what is, what is he saying? And then he told me, you know, because in the, in, in the family we have papers about the death of my uncle, it corresponds to the day, the very day. So my suspect is that what Primo Levi is telling us in this page is that they killed my uncle. And this is what he told me last year. And I couldn't, you know, do... Anything, anything else than saying, I'm afraid to tell you that this is what happened. And starting from that night, we became friends. And we had, you know, had been researching about the story of Luciano together. Uh, I mean, it was a long answer, but I think it was worth telling it. Her. Claire, my wife, is here, and she used to say, you want to be an enfant terrible, so just, you know, get it. Get their, you know, pay the price for that. Uh, I don't think I want to be an enfant terrible. Uh, I think it, 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 this is what historians are supposed to do. And, of course, uh, this is why I was starting my, you know, conversation tonight saying that if I were to find, to, to, to pick up a saint, in my, lay, in my lay ward, unreligious one, it would be Primo Levi. In that sense, what I, I have been doing in this book is quite different from what I tried to do with Padre Pio's book in the sense that that ward, it didn't you know, belong to my identity at all. And somehow I was detached from that ward, except that you know, I was somehow offending or somehow disturbing other communities, which is fair enough. Mm, to tell you the truth, I, I had to afford a trial for the Padre Pio book. 
because I was you know, taken to court by Padre Pio's nephew. Uh, he asked me one million euros for having blackened the reputation of his uncle. And yes, uh, I was not. <laughs> I mean, even the candle price would have, would have been enough uh, uh, to, to pay for that. But uh, yes, uh, I feel bad about this. But uh, it doesn't prevent me from trying to make my job. This working? Uh, my question is, is embarrass whoops, embarrassing because I think I missed something. Um, did you describe the reasons for your belief that Primo Levi did, in fact, uh, or was involved in the killing of these people? I only heard the part about the text, and I must have missed other evidence indicating that that indeed happened and that that's why we could interpret the text yeah. that way. Yeah, thank you for asking that because of course it's very crucial. Although it is crucial more, I would say, in the legal sense of the question than in the moral one. Because in the moral sense of the question, Primo Levi already provided an answer. He, he didn't say they killed. They had to execute a death sentence. He, he wrote we. And uh, uh, so he, decided to, uh, not only to bear witness of this, but to share responsibility for this. So this is the moral side of it. The, not the legal, but the practical side of it uh, is that I don't think, uh, I mean at all, that he was the one who operated the machine gun. Actually, I wouldn't, I would, I would never subscribe such a, such a, uh, such a point. But then there were very few. Uh, yes, uh, what, I'm, uh, what I told you tonight is based on archival evidence. Uh, according to their place and to the situation, I was not going on their mm, technicalities of, uh, of the story. But uh, what I knew, what I learned about this, uh, I found in archives in Aosta, Turin, Alessandria, Asti, Milan. Uh, and particularly about the ugly secret, this is what I could find in Aosta. Uh, in the archive of the tribunal, of the Aosta tribunal, the court of Aosta. And by the way, these papers were, had never been looked at by anybody because they are not, strictly speaking, public. Uh, so what happened is that one of the senior you know, people in that very small unit took the responsibility of killing these two kids. Kids, I mean, youth, young, young rebels. And what the, the, the person responsible of it in their testimonies they gave to the fascists when they were arrested, because after this they were all captured, and uh, the... the policemen, the fascist policemen, they were asking them about these two guys. Because this was a very, you know, small community. Saint Vincent, Amai, you know, two hours away by, by you know, feet. but in any case, people knew, even in Aosta, about the two young rebels killed a few days before. And so when they were captured, they were asked, why did you do it? And uh, they were you know, saying what I told you. They were saying, we couldn't be a, we couldn't trust those two youth anymore. Because they were saying they were communists. They were saying, what is the problem? We are doing the resistance. And I mean, if we want to do this to change this country, this country has been fascist for 20 years, let's make it communist. And if we want to make, you know, to, 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 to make communist, uh, to make this country communist, this means that everybody, everything's going to be of everybody. I mean, these kind of things. Very naive and very, what, tentative, uh, you know, projects for the future. But then they were, they became maybe untrustable. Because what they said was, if you don't let us do it, 
we are going to do it in any case. If, and if you don't let us do it here in Amai, we are going to leave this place to go down. And if somebody ask us, ask, ask about, uh, asks us about you, we are going to tell you, to tell them, to tell them that, uh, I mean, we were with you, but then you didn't want us to do what you wanted to do. I mean, very pros prosaic things. The resistance was, is not a myth. It would be too nice. And again, even this archival evidence, I mean, we still have to, you know, to weight it with, 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 very, with much accuracy because this is what they were telling fascist policemen. So this is not necessarily the truth. But, you know, they, they did it. And they said the, the person who was operating the machine gun was Sergente Berto. And then, no, there is no evidence about Sergente Berto in the archives, I know. So what happened is that basically they were protecting each other. Sergente Berto, there is no other evidence of Sergente Berto in Italian archives. <laughs> uh, when I met Aldo Piacenza in Turin, who was the most skilled in military terms of the unit. He had fight, uh, fought in, uh, in Russia on the Eastern Front as, a, as a, a, a soldier in the Italian military in 1941, 1942. He knew what a war was like because of the Eastern Front. And he was somehow the military boss of this very tiny partisan unit. So, I suspect that Sergente Berto was Aldo. But this is not something I will write because I have no evidence about that. If it were not him, it were one of the two Jewish brothers who you know, were named Baki, who were you know, acquaintances, Primo Levi's acquaintances and who were, belonged as this unit as well. They were, Primo Levi wrote that there were 12 in this unit. 12. And I think he counted in that Luciana and Wanda. So 10 men. And two of them were killed, Luciano and Fulvio. They were, there was not much left. I know them name by name. You see, so what the, the, thing, the only thing I would be, you know, really, mm, what? Sorry? Sure about is that Primo Levi was not behind the machine gun. He was not the one who, you know, was triggered there. But then he said we, and I wanted to listen to him. They, yes, I did. Yes, I did. They don't know much about him. Uh, they, they, they are unable to claim that he was an, an anti-fascist. He was not. In that sense, I think Luciano, maybe Fulvio, they were representative of most partisans in the early stages of the resistance. We shouldn't think of this as a formal, political, ideological choice, except for the minority who was politically already trained, motivated. I mean, communists who, who had been you know, in Spain in the 30s or you know, in the Soviet Union even before that. I mean, already partisans were a minority, but ideologically and politically uh, shaped, so to speak, partisans were very much a minority in the minority. So Luciano's nephew doesn't have uh, a family memory to, uh, to you know, build on to explain the choice of his uncle. Uh, his answer is that it was not a choice. It was just you know, their fortune, so to speak. I, 
I never met Luciana Nissim, who passed away uh, uh, at the stage of my research when I was still you know, unable to, to be prepared eventually to interview her. Uh, what she said, because again, this is something I, not only I didn't invent, of course, but this is not something I, I found. It was already there. Except that you can hardly find it in you know, Primo Levi's bibliography. The, the, you can find it in Primo Levi's oeuvre, as I showed you, but not in uh, er, the oeuvre on Primo Levi. So Luciana Nissim was asked by others, how did you feel about the killing of these two young uh, rebels? And uh, she didn't provide an answer. And then uh, Primo Levi's sister, who was not there anymore at the time of the killings, but who had been there, as I told you, until the week before, she was, uh, she's still alive. I didn't meet her. I think she is uh, too aged to be able now to, to, to be functional, so to speak, in an uh, interview. But she once answered uh, that specific question, and that is, uh, how do you think that your, your two female you know, friends, Luciana and Vanda, reacted to that killing? And she's, she said, and this is published, she, she said uh, they didn't assist to the execution. They put her, actually they put them, the two girls, apart. Which I think it's uh, an, an extra, another evidence of the fact that other men, so to speak, the male components of this, such a small unit, were there. If they were not on the very site of the killings, they were just, you know, there, I mean, around. This is unescapable. I mean, you can't, you can't be in Amai and not to be there where they were killed. By the way, uh, Luciano, through Luciano's, Luciano's, Luciano's sister is still alive. And I didn't meet her, but uh, Davide, of course, it, it's her aunt, uh, was asking to her, his aunt questions I was somehow suggesting. And she's the one who, after the war, went up in the mountains in the Aosta Valley to take away the remains of his brother, which had been, been buried two years before. And uh, I mean, what, what happened is, the, I, I wouldn't want you to think that this was exceptional. This is a civil war. I'm not putting the blame on anybody. Maybe the only people I'm putting somehow the blame in, in, in an indirect way is the people who don't want to listen to this story. And people who think that this story is dangerous for the cause which, by the way, is my cause, and with, which is the one of anti-fascist values, and somehow, you know, the cause of the resistance. If this is, you know, this is something you want to say on the year 2000, 2012. But what happened is that they buried them just under, I mean, this was not, of course, a regular funeral. It couldn't be so. And so they buried them um, just a few centimeters down, and they put the two names on the trees, on two trees close by, to be able, after the war, at least to find the bodies. And so this 90 years old person who is, was and is Luciano's sister recently told to his nephew, Davide, who told me that when she got there and she was asking, this was after the liberation of Italy, of course. She couldn't do so under the German occupation. And so when she went there with her father, with Luciano's father, to you know, get evidence about what happened, and to, she was told, at, at, at the beginning she was, oh, we don't know, we don't know. We, of course, people were not eager to answer the question, of, the question about what happened to these two. Uh, young rebels two years before. But then ultimately somebody was ready to tell her pieces of the story. And apparently what happened is that they told them, they told the father and the sister, go uphill, 
go to Amai. And they, they were more specific about the, 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 the precise site. And they would say, and you want to dig where you will find two pieces of papers on the, on the trees. And the two pieces of paper were still there. And uh, close by, there were the two bodies. We could go on for another hour, but we <laughs> must draw this to an end. One of the uh, great uh, generous donations beyond the uh, Kundal Prize that Peter Kundal made to McGill was the Department of History and Classical Studies. Uh, he left a generous donation that has funded the Kundal Fellowships, uh, which go to our top PhD students. One of these students this evening, Catherine Ulmer, is going to thank Sergio Luzzato for his presentation. Catherine? Um, on behalf of the audience and the Kundal Book Prize, I'd like to thank you for that fascinating lecture. And as a token of the Book Prize's appreciation, I'd like to give you this plaque. So this seems to be, I mean, I'm back, uh, I'm back to Padre Pio, actually. <laughs> and uh, is that, okay. So again, thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you to you all. Bye-bye. I want to thank you all for being here uh, this afternoon for this fascinating discussion. Uh, if you want to follow the um, actions of the uh, Kundal Prize Gala this evening, uh, follow me on Twitter, at Dean underscore Manfredi. I'll be live tweeting the event. Uh, I'm, I've got 400 followers. I'm aiming for to get to 500. So if you're on Twitter and you're not following me yet, please do it now. So again, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.